Hello and welcome back to the channel. I appreciate you dropping in and if you enjoy the content, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that fun stuff. And if you're looking to help support the channel, make sure you check out my new merch. There's a link in the description and you can see how beautiful this coffee mug is, the t-shirt, the sweatshirt, oh yeah. That mug is my favorite though, for real. Big shout out to everyone who's already ordered one and sent me pictures over on Twitter, much love. And if you're looking for more content, including true crime, make sure to join me over at the Chilling app. It's an app with hundreds of scary stories, true crime, all kinds of different things, and there's a bunch of different narrators. And not only that, you can choose your own ambient background music. And did I mention there's a sleep timer and you can turn your screen off, and you can download videos so you don't have to use the data. That's what I'm talking about. We're coming out with new updates all the time, and we are doing a lot of giveaways all the time, so make sure you keep your eyes out for that. To get your free three-day trial, make sure to click the link in the description. And after that, it's only $2.99 a month, but it is completely ad-free. So you're not going to get partway through a story and then have some blasting ad come through wake you up if you're trying to go to sleep or anything. Ad-free, baby. Ad-free. And without any further ado, let's begin. And as always, this video may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Present in the room here, if uh, I could just have each of you identify yourself for the purposes of uh, the videotape that's being made. Uh, seated to my left, off the camera, and um, now sitting at the table is your counsel. Just please identify yourself. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's uh, Anthony Bryant. And uh, straight across the table for me, if you could identify yourself. I'm Constable Darlene Coolis, C O U L I S, badge number 6483 from Toronto Police Service. And seated to my right, if you could just identify yourself. Paul Jason Teal. AKA Paul Bernardo. Paul Bernardo grew up in a broken home. His legal father, Kenneth, had a criminal history, facing charges for peeping and pedophilia. He was also very violent towards his family. Despite growing up in such a home, Paul was a happy kid. But at just age 10, his violent tendencies were beginning to show as he liked to cause fires. When Paul was 18, he found out that Kenneth was not his biological father. Learning that he was the offspring of an affair between his mother and another man was not easy, and Paul did not take the revelation well. He started to abuse his mother, calling her nasty names. His mother swore back at him, calling him a bastard. After that, Paul's love for fires grew, along with his hatred of women. When his girlfriend left him for a friend, he burned all the things she had given to him. At just 18, he became promiscuous, dating several women and treating them all terribly. Paul's violent tendencies kept brewing inside of him. He inflicted harm on most of his girlfriends and threatened many of them with death. A couple of his girlfriends managed to get a restraining order against him. But for the most part, Paul got away with all the horrific things he did. Twisted fantasies were starting to take root in him. One of them was to build a virgin farm where he could prey on virgin girls, assault them, and breed more. Carla Homolka, Paul's soon-to-be wife, also grew up in a broken home. Her father was a violent drunk who cheated on his wife. But when Carla's mother found out, she merely invited the other woman to her marital bed as well. Under such circumstances, Carla grew up big-headed and stubborn. Carla started to gain notoriety at school after she cut herself and claimed to be suicidal. She was developing dark tendencies from a young age, just like Paul. By the time she met Paul, she was both sadistic and masochistic. Paul and Carla met in 1987 when he was 23 and she was 18. That year, Paul had gone through a breakup with his girlfriend, who threatened to report him to the police. He also assaulted two women that same year. And when he met Carla, they got along instantly. Although he was furious when he found out Carla had lost her virginity. Unlike most of the girls Paul dated, at least Carla welcomed his violence and sexual behavior. This made her stand out from the rest. 
She even took note of all the things she could do to improve herself in Paul's eyes. The following year, the police started to search for the Scarborough rapist, not knowing that they were actually looking for Paul. They had ample evidence and an accurate sketch of Paul, but they failed to track him down, allowing Paul to roam freely. Even when a victim came forward, alleging that Paul assaulted and raped her and that Carla videotaped her entire ordeal, the police did nothing. Later on, another victim recognized Paul as the man in the composite sketch the police had of the Scarborough rapist. But this did little to move the police. They merely collected some of Paul's DNA, which they would not test for a couple of years. Meanwhile, Paul had started smuggling cigarettes across the U.S.-Canadian border for a living. If only the police had caught Paul sooner, they would have saved lives and stopped some of the most twisted crimes in Canadian history from taking place. Paul, who had already assaulted several women and shown an affinity with violence, had gotten into a relationship with someone willing to turn his dream of a virgin farm into a reality. The worst was yet to come. And their next victim was none other than Carla's younger sister, Tammy, who was just 15 years old. Carla saw this as an opportunity to redeem herself to Paul. Since she was not a virgin herself, she intended to hand her youngest sister over to Paul as a virgin sacrifice. Paul started stalking Tammy and eventually hatched a plan with Carla. They would drug Tammy so that Paul could assault her and Carla would be present the entire time. Carla would even ensure that Tammy remained a virgin until then. The first time they tried to execute their plan, they laced Tammy's food with Valium, but she woke up after a minute. They waited for a few months before trying again. The next time they went through with their plan, they spiked Tammy's drink with sleeping pills. And while she was unconscious, Carla held a cloth soaked with aesthetic over Tammy's nose and mouth. Tammy started to puke and passed away. Paul and Carla simply cleaned up, destroyed evidence of what they had done, dressed Tammy, and called 911. Tammy's death was ruled an accident. At Tammy's funeral, Paul left a picture of him and Carla in her coffin. They would later roleplay what happened that night. Carla would roleplay of her younger sister, even going so far as to dress like Tammy. We needed the Hall of Fame. I guess it would probably be me knowing more about anesthetics and the fact that sleeping pills might not keep her completely asleep. Yeah. This was my idea, not his, was to call um, the drugstore and tell them that I needed it for clinic use. The reason I told them for clinic use was because that way I didn't have to give a name. All I had to do was give a doctor's name. Those burns are possibly chemical in nature and anti-mortem. The only chemical that was near her was the halophane. It was not placed on her face directly. It was held, as I said, like this, this far away. A month later, Paul kidnapped Leslie Mahaffey at knife point. She was just 14. Her family had locked her out of the house for being out past curfew that day, and Paul took advantage of this. He took her home and told Carla he had brought a playmate for them. They filmed all of the evil things they did to Leslie before strangling her to death with a cord. They hid her body in the basement and later cut it up, putting each dismembered part in wet cement. When the eight blocks of cement hardened, they threw them into a lake. Showing no signs of slowing down, in 1992, Paul and Carla claimed another victim. Kristen French was walking home from Holy Cross Secondary School when Paul and Carla approached her. They told her they needed help with directions, and while Kristen was helping them out, Paul attacked her and kidnapped her at knife point. They took Kristen to their home where they forced a severe amount of alcohol down her throat. They then raped and tortured her for three days. The entire time they wanted Kristen to submit to Paul. Instead, Kristen called him a bastard. Paul beat her senseless until she died. They then disposed of her body in a ditch and went on with their life. A month later, the police interviewed Paul. 
they concluded that he was not the main suspect after all. The police finally caught up with Paul and Carla in December of 1992. It all started when Paul beat Carla, leaving her with two black eyes and broken ribs. At work, Carla claimed her injuries were the result of an accident, but her co-workers did not believe her. They ended up contacting the police and taking Carla to the hospital. At this point, Carla changed her story and confessed that Paul had been physically abusive for a long time. After Carla's confessions, the police finally arrested Paul. Coincidentally, the police finally tested the DNA samples they had taken from Paul a few years back. Finally, they had got off their lazy bums and caught the Scarborough rapist. After being released from the hospital, Carla lived with her uncle and aunt. Knowing that she now had to watch her own back, she decided to play the role of a battered wife and told her uncle and aunt everything that Paul had done. She then sought immunity in exchange for her cooperation. But the prosecution in Paul's case offered her 12 years in exchange for her testimony. She accepted the deal and fed the police her own version of events. I said, well, we have to go to my parents for, for Easter dinner. And he said, well, why don't we just not go? And I said, well, I don't think it would look very good. I mean, we're supposed to go to my parents for Easter dinner and we don't go. And I said, well, how's it going to look if, um, you know, this girl's missing and we have no alibi? We haven't gone anywhere. We haven't done anything. And uh, he said, well, I guess you're right. And because he wanted to keep her for longer. And I didn't want to. Like, I was going to work. I didn't want to go to work knowing that this girl was in my house and she could escape so easily. And I didn't. I was afraid. So. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday. But I knew that she. I knew that she had to. Be gone. In 1995, Paul finally saw his day in court. The judge sentenced him to life in prison, and while serving time, other inmates were desperate to get back at him for his crimes against young girls. As far as Carla's 12-year deal goes, nobody was happy about that. Not the prosecution that offered it, nor the public. Once the videotapes that Paul and Carla had taken of their crimes surfaced, Carla's 12-year deal became known as the deal with the devil. Aside from the videotapes, Carla's interviews with authorities highlighted how dark and twisted she was. When she gave the police a tour of the house she and Paul had raped and killed in, she dressed up in a school uniform as if to mock her victims. She also asked if the police damaged the furniture during the investigation. While she showed the investigator the basement where they had put the lifeless bodies of their victims, she asked if she could keep the rug that the bodies had been rested on. Can you answer a question for me? Was any of the furniture damaged as a result of the investigation? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, great, so I'm asking for Can I ask you a question? Can I I'm have, afraid I can't can answer Can I have that question. rug? My sister wants it. Um, or does that have to stay here? That has to stay for okay. now, but we can make those arrangements. Okay, thank you. And my Christmas tree. After being released from prison in 2005, Carla married Thierry Bordialis, the brother of her defense attorney. While Paul rots behind bars, Carla has lived a quiet life, trying her hardest to avoid the public eye. Over a decade into Paul's lifelong prison sentence, the authorities interviewed him again. They were trying to make sense of the other unsolved mysteries they believed Paul played a part in. But Paul was too bitter about Carla betraying him. Okay. Um, so the crust of what we're here to talk about is that uh, it has been suggested that uh, in the continuing case of the disappearance of Elizabeth Bain and, and the charge of murder against Robert Baltovich, that you are the alternative suspect, or an alternative suspect. Are you aware of that? Yeah, yeah, great. Did you kill Elizabeth Bain on June the 19th, 1990? Well, it's a loaded question. I mean, are we going to go back and, 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 and go through the, the time sequence of what happened in my life? I mean, I, I could just give a yes or no answer, but 
you know, there's a lot of issues about that. Right. You know, the, the car was in my role, who did what, where, when, this is why I said, did you guys, you know, go down there to get a polygraph to get, to see if she was telling the truth? Like, why didn't Bevan do it in the first place? I mean, he's polygraphing everyone with a Camaro, why would he make a deal with someone and not give them a polygraph? It, it, it's not incomprehensible to me. Uh, you know, because now I'm sitting, my file says her version, and it's a lie. <laughs> you know? I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I, you know, I'm not making frivolous points here. I mean, and now you're asking me, after you, after you said Peel Regional said I'm lying about this, and then you're saying I'm lying about my profile, you're saying I'm lying if I'm better or not, now you're saying, hey, did you kill this person? I mean, well, you're saying I'm lying here, here, and here. I could say, no, I didn't. Uh, but, I mean, you already said I'm lying here with the Peel, you're saying. Okay. I'm, not you know, saying I'm not saying anything no, but, about who's lying. I'm simply... Uh, and I've given you directions to go to find the truth. Right. No one's, and I've, no one's done that. And I've asked, and, and again, I've told you that I've uh, done investigation on information that you've told me, and, and as a result of that information, I've been able to... Uh, Verify in my mind where you've told me the truth. So if Peel yeah. Region is lying about you or someone else is lying about you, I have no control over that or no. It goes right to credibility. Well, absolutely it does. And that's, I guess, the, the easy way that is to, if we can go through, we'll answer the questions. And yes, I hope to be able to go through some timeline to identify where you were, what you were doing specifically in relation to this this case. Anyways, I know I'm giving you guys a hard time being argumentative about certain things, but. I mean, really, I'm a human being, and when you guys do all these things, I, I've got to, anyways, I'll, I'll try and truncate it a little bit more, but, anyways, the answer to that is, is no, but, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is, that's a life 25 sentence, you know, it really comes down to credibility, right. and, and not only credibility, but then again, timeline, I mean, between what Carlos and my roles were, respectively, and this and that, the answer is no to that question. Did you have anything to do with her disappearance? No. D did you know Elizabeth B? Not that I know of. Had you ever met her? I'm going to answer that with uh, I don't remember. Because if I did or I didn't, I, I don't remember. But I know an ex-girlfriend trying to say I might have, but I guess I don't remember. Um, you are obviously are aware of her disappearance. Do you recall when you became aware of this? Best that I can really recollect is after I was in jail. Didn't follow me as much. Um, the date, obviously, June the nineteenth, nineteen ninety, was the but, date. But 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 you know, other other than that, I don't remember. You know, maybe I, I heard about it before, but I can't, can't recall. Can't recall if I did or not. But I remember in jail, I had newspapers after that fact. Okay. Um, we'll we'll sort of get into that a little bit when we. Uh, I hope to go through a bit of a timeline with you as to some things that may jog your memory as to yeah, we're uh, back in that time. I mean, if, if you ask me what I was doing three weeks ago on Tuesday, I probably couldn't tell you unless you put some reference to it. So uh, we'll hopefully be able to do that. Um, and again, obviously, uh, June the nineteenth, nineteen ninety. Do you know what you were doing that day? Um, I, I have uh, a document here in front of me that uh, references some points in time around the, the, the June of 1990 period from police investigation. This is what um, indicates you may have been involved with or may have certain things that you may have done. I'd like to go through a couple of them that um, sort of may sort of assist you in remembering what you were doing back in. The first part of June uh, 1990, actually June the 1st, uh, Carla had a, a doctor's appointment um, where she was complaining of pains in her right side. Um, perhaps she had something to do with a rabies shot. Does that ring any bells? No, no, no. In the first part of June, you, you had a Nissan 240SX, is that correct? Yeah. You were making several trips into the United States, uh, June 2nd, June 3rd, June 10th, June 16th. I, I think at that point you were involved with cigarette smuggling and things like that, from what I recall. Someone said no. 
No, that would be. No, that was until last week. Okay. So, um, making several trips to the states within a couple of days. That's that's something. When we started the relationship, we were going over all the time. So, just for personal reasons. Okay. Um, on June the sixteenth, you uh, shopped at Rough Hewen. Is that in the Niagara Falls, United States? Is that? Store sound familiar to you? Yeah, it sounds familiar. I have no idea if those are the dates, but okay. Experts who have examined Paul have concluded that he's a psychopath. Carla, on the other hand, was diagnosed with high bristophilia. This condition enabled her to enjoy watching Paul inflict physical and sexual violence on others. Due to their good looks, they're known today as the Ken and Barbie killers and are some of the most well-known serial killers in Canadian history. Their terrifying crimes are studied for their criminal and psychological implications. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. People are fucked up, dude. I'll tell you what. I think everyone knows that. I've said it before, and I'm sure I'll say it again at some point, but my goodness. I don't understand the different wiring in people's brains. But that's probably because I'm not wired like that. Regardless, I hope you do your best to stay safe out there. And I will catch you in the next video. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye.